Well, if you will, this evening, please open your Bibles to Mark's Gospel. Mark's Gospel, chapter 1. I'm going to read a few passages here as we begin this evening. And we'll be considering our third artery in this Gospel, the Kingdom of God. The Kingdom of God. And this doctrine... This uh, teaching, this truth, this theme in Scripture is one that uh, has filled multiple books, and I trust that tonight as we look at it from Mark's gospel, it will be an encouragement to us as it was intended, even as Mark wrote the gospel to Christians who were uh, in pressured places, uh, to know that there is a king And the king is not Nero, the king is the Lord. He is the sovereign over all. And that the Son of God is the one who will come and establish his kingdom. But those in Christ have the assurance and joy of knowing that whatever happens on earth, their sins are forgiven as they turn to the Lord Jesus and respond to his preaching of the kingdom to repent and believe the gospel. We're going to begin by just reading a couple of passages where we find this theme, the kingdom of God. And the first one is is in chapter 1, verse 14, as Jesus begins his public ministry. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. And now here's the content of that proclamation saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So this is the theme of Christ's ministry, preaching the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. If we move over to chapter 4, Mark chapter 4, where we find Jesus teaching the kingdom parables, And let's jump down to verse 26. In verse 26 and in verse 30, Jesus introduces two parables that are similes for the kingdom of God. He says the kingdom of God, in verse 26, is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. And then verse 30, and he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. And then if you would, turn over to chapter 9. And what we're doing is just looking at a couple of places where Jesus is continuing to proclaim the kingdom of God through this gospel and establishing that Jesus is indeed preaching the kingdom of God, and it characterizes his ministry. Chapter 9, toward the end of the chapter, let's look at verse 45. Jesus is warning about being a stumbling block. And he says, And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another." The kingdom of God permeates Jesus' teaching. It's what he is proclaiming as he is here on earth, as he came to earth. 
And so we want to think about this and understand, first of all, as we, as we prepare to delve into the kingdom of God, the teaching of the kingdom tonight, there are two elements we want to understand. First of all, the kingdom of God is a critical doctrine. It's a critical doctrine. And what I mean by that is when you look at chapter 9, and Jesus says it's better if, if you enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. There's a distinction that he makes here, either kingdom of God or thrown into hell. And if you turn over to Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, as we just establish again that the kingdom of God is a critical doctrine, in Colossians chapter 1, as Paul is giving thanks for the Colossians and he is expressing to them how he prays for them, beginning in verse 9, he, he ends that portion in verse 13 with a statement of what God has done for the Colossians, for all those who are in Christ. And he says, Colossians 1, 13 and 14, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The kingdom of God is a critical doctrine. There are two kinds of people. There are those who are in darkness and those who are in the kingdom of the beloved son. And Praise the Lord, what Paul expresses here is those that have been in darkness have been transferred to the kingdom of the beloved Son. And there is hope for those who are still in darkness, who are outside of the kingdom of God as they turn to Christ. There's a, a transfer that takes place from this domain of darkness where if you remain in the domain of darkness, if you remain in your sins, if you remain outside of the redemption that is in Christ, if you remain in the slave market of sin, Jesus said in Mark chapter 9, the end result is that you will spend eternity apart from the presence of God, the gracious presence of God in hell in a place of torment. This is a critical doctrine. It identifies the two kinds of people in the world right now, those that are part of the kingdom and those that are outside of the kingdom. But it's also a comforting doctrine for believers as those who turn to Christ, and as Paul speaks in, uh, in, first, or in Colossians here, that, that those that are, that are in the kingdom of his beloved son, this, this is a comforting doctrine. And if you would turn a few pages over to 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, again, when Paul begins this epistle, after one of his typical greetings in verse 3, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning in verse 3, he writes, We ought always to give thanks to you, to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly. And the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness of faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. Now, verse 5, this is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also are suffering. Paul is, is stating here to the Thessalonians that the suffering that they're enduring, the afflictions that they are facing are normative, are normative for kingdom citizens and that the hope is not in the absence of affliction and persecution in this life, but in the future manifestation and the fulfillment of the coming kingdom of God 
in its fullness of which those in Christ will be a part. And he says, that's comforting for you. Suffering, suffering in this life as a kingdom citizen, suffering in this life is more significant than even successes. Because it's demonstrating as you endure that your hope is not here and now, your hope is there and then. And so this is a comforting doctrine. So as we, as we look at this tonight, I hope these two elements will, will challenge you. First of all, if, if there are those who are hearing tonight, here or over the live stream, and, and you, you don't know what your kingdom is. You don't know where your citizenship is. You need to understand this is critical. The, the ramifications are eternal, eternal. You're either in darkness or you're in the kingdom of the beloved Son. And there's an appeal, and the reason we have the Scriptures, the reason we have the revelation of Jesus Christ in the Gospels, it's the proclamation that He came to save you from your sin. And for those, those who repent and believe the gospel are transferred from the domain of darkness and into the kingdom of his beloved son. And so at the beginning, at the outset, let me just extend on, out of the, uh, the authority of what Christ says in his word, extend the offer of Christ to you. Turn to Christ and be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And for those who are in the kingdom, be assured that this is for our comfort. We have a greater king whose name is Jesus Christ. And that reality permeates our, our perspective for every aspect of our lives. Christian biography, good Christian biography, is often so helpful to see the lives of those who've gone before us and be encouraged in their faithfulness. One of my heroes is David Brainerd, who served the Indians in Massachusetts and in Pennsylvania from 1743 to 1749, back when it was an awful, horrible wilderness, and that was his description. So bad that as he would go uh, sometimes from western Massachusetts into Pennsylvania, in one instance, his horse broke a leg and he had to put his horse down because the, the terrain was so rough and continue on on foot and just suffered hardship after hardship after hardship. But he had devoted his life to bringing the gospel to these Indians and he began his ministry in earnest in 1743, but there was very little fruit at the outset. You can imagine the, the Indians were a bit wary of, of any white man that would come and, and speak to them because of all of the abuse that they had suffered. And then there was the language barrier, and even if you had a translator, that translator probably wasn't a Christian, so there wasn't the same passion as he translated the message from Brainerd to the other Indians. And then just the general hardships of living in the wilderness in the mid-1700s, things that are probably beyond our comprehension. But for two years, he had been laboring among the Indians with very little fruit. On February 3rd in 1745, he recorded the following in his journal. He said, I felt a peace in my own soul and was satisfied that if not one of the Indians should be profited by my preaching, but all should be damned, yet I should be accepted and rewarded as faithful, for I am persuaded that God enabled me to be so. And you have to understand what he's communicating here. He has a great heart and a, and a love for the, the Indians, but he recognizes that that it's not about the outcomes, it's not about the results, it's about the him serving his king. And, and what, he, what he is expressing as he says, I felt a peace in my own soul and was satisfied. He's expressing his satisfaction that 
I'm going to serve my king here no matter what the outcome because I'm, I'm his servant and, and all, I, all I'm called to do is be faithful. Brainerd grasped that at the most basic level, the kingdom of God is something that belongs to God. And so he can do whatever he wants. Jesus captured this mindset in Luke 17.10 when he told his disciples, So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, We are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. This, this truth, this doctrine of the kingdom of God is, is comforting and it's liberating for us to, to just faithfully serve our king and do so out of a love for him, not of an expectation that we're going to change the world or have all kinds of great accolades. That's, that's not the kingdom of God. So to this point, as we go back to Mark's gospel, to this point, we've looked at the artery of the Son of God through the, the gospel of Mark. And just to re refresh our, remem our memory, that the definitive confession of Christ as the Son of God, the sovereign Son of Psalm 2 and the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 comes at the cross in chapter 15, verse 39, where the centurion says, this indeed was the Son of God. And, and that's part of Mark's emphasis is showing Christ, the sovereign Son, and the suffering servant giving his life as a ransom for many, chapter 10, verse 45. And we've also looked at the gospel of God, that Christ is the gospel. It's the beginning, going back to chapter 1, and the first statement of this gospel, it's the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He is the gospel. And then down in verse 14, where we began this evening, Jesus then came proclaiming the gospel of God. He is the preeminent proclaimer of the gospel. It's the good news, the declaration that the kingdom of God is at hand in the person of Christ and that Christ is come to deal with sins. And of course, this is what John the Baptist preached as he called people to repent for the forgiveness of their sins. So this evening, we'll delve into this topic, this doctrine of the kingdom of God. And we're going to do that by answering two simple questions. Two simple questions this evening. The first is, what is the kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of God? And the second, who gets into the kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of God? And who gets into the kingdom of God? And what we'll do is survey the texts in Mark that deal with the kingdom of God to answer those questions. So somewhat of an inductive study, surveying the text and then bringing uh, some conclusions uh, to bear with the, with the breadth of the text that we've looked at. So we're in chapter 1, and we'll begin here with this first appearance and answering the question, what is the kingdom of God? Jesus says in verse 15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So the first observation we're going to make concerning the kingdom is that the kingdom is near in the person of Christ. The kingdom of God is at hand. And this comes, this comes at, at the conclusion of the prologue where Mark has set up that Christ is the fulfillment of prophecy. He's, he's the fulfillment of the plan for righteousness that's been laid out in eternity past and expressed in the prophets. In verses 2 and 3, he quotes the prophets, and he's, he is leading 
us to the appearance of John, but he says, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. And so verse 4, John appeared. There's the fulfillment of these passages. John appeared. The fullness of the time is here. And and he came and he preached Christ. And then in verse 9, In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the wilderness. And if you recall in Matthew chapter 4, where you have the same scene, Jesus says concerning that baptism, this is necessary so that we can fulfill all righteousness. He's fulfilling his Father's will in everything that is taking place. Immediately after the baptism, verse 12, the Spirit drives Christ into the wilderness, and He was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan, and He was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to Him, and then John is arrested. That was the signal for Christ to begin His public ministry. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Well, how is it at hand? It's near in the person of Jesus Christ, who is the imprint, who is the exposition of God. The rule of God is coming near to man through Jesus Christ. And what we find as we look at, again, verses 14 and 15, Jesus comes proclaiming the gospel. This is his activity, his primary activity. And then the content of that proclamation, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. The nearness of the kingdom of God, the nearness of God's reign, constitutes the gospel, right? This is the content of the gospel. The kingdom of God is near. And then we also find, based on that, when Christ proclaims the kingdom of God, he also proclaims a response at the end of verse 15. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Repent and believe the gospel. And so we observe from that statement that the kingdom of God Whatever it is, as we're answering this question, what is the kingdom of God? It it definitely includes a spiritual aspect because he's proclaiming it. And as he's proclaiming it, the response he says, the, the, the response that Christ commands to the proclamation is repent, believe. And so there's a spiritual aspect to this kingdom. Let's go over to chapter 4. Chapter 4. The first parable that Jesus teaches is the parable of the sower, but I'd like to draw your attention here to verse 11. After the twelve ask Him about the parables, Jesus says, "...to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God." But for those outside, everything is in parables. So a couple of of additional observations from this passage. First of all, the kingdom of God has not always been evident. To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. And if you turn over quickly to uh, Ephesians chapter 3, There are many other passages that express this reality. But in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul, the wording is different, but, but the principle is the same. Paul says in verse 2, Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery 
was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men and other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ through the gospel. So Paul here is expanding. It's, it's as we move into the epistles, they expand what's being taught in the gospels. But he's expanding this reality that, that there was a secret aspect of God's revelation that wasn't revealed until Christ came. The, the theme that I like to use for Ephesians 3, a little teaching thing, is right, there, there's a mystery, it's covered up, mystery revealed. And that mystery is the gospel. It's not a whodunit mystery. It's something that God cloaked until the fullness of time. And so this the secret of the kingdom, it's not something that's always been evident. And we also see in this passage that the kingdom of God will not be disclosed to all. This is a sobering statement. Those out, but for those outside, everything is in parables, and it'll continue in verse 12, so that they may indeed see but not perceive and may indeed hear but not understand lest they should turn and be forgiven the kingdom of god will not be disclosed to all and within the gospel we actually see that taking place if you look back at chapter 2 it's interesting how mark arranges his material after introducing Christ's public ministry in chapter 1, verse 15, you have five scenes that substantiate Christ's person as an authoritative figure. You would expect someone who is the Son of God to change things, and that's what happens in each of those five scenes. It's glorious. It's like Christ just bursts on the scene and people leave their nets and follow him and demons are subdued and people are healed and, and, and Peter begins to be taught and lepers are cleansed. But then in chapter 2, as Christ continues his ministry, you have a tension that begins to build and there are five scenes in a row where Jesus is in conflict with the religious leaders. And that appears in questions. Look at chapter 2, verse 7. After Jesus has healed or, or, or forgiven the paralytic, verse 7, the scribes say, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And then if you run your eyes down to verse 16, as Jesus is eating with tax collectors and sinners, again, the question of the Pharisees, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And then in the next scene, in verse 18, why, does John, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And then the next scene, on a Sabbath, in verse 24, the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And then when you get into the first scene of chapter 3, Jesus flips the script and he asks them a question in verse 4, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to kill? And they're silent, but then when Jesus heals the man with the withered hand, verse 6, the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. And so you're going to have this conflict that's going to run all the way through the gospel. And Jesus says, yes, there are, there are those, chapter 4, who are outside. They're hardened. And there's an element of mercy in the way that Jesus is teaching of the kingdom through parables because of that. 
down in verse 26, in verses 26 through 29, with what we read earlier, the parable of the seed growing, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground, and then he describes how it grows at the end of that parable in verse 29, but when the grain is ripe at once, he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. What we find is that the kingdom of God requires time to ripen, but will have a swift conclusion. And then in verse 30, the parable of the mustard seed, verse 31, pick up in verse 31, it's like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. The kingdom of God starts small and expands over time. All right, so we're seeing these pictures. Jesus is teaching. He's filling out. And, and as we go through Mark, we'll, we'll nuance the different applications. There's some applications to the Jews at that time and then broader applications as well. And we'll, we look forward to going through those as we work through the gospel. But turn over to chapter 9 again, Mark chapter 9, where we find the next occurrence of the statement of the kingdom of God. Chapter 9, verse 1. This is after Peter has confessed Christ, and then Jesus has begun to teach of his crucifixion. Peter rebuked Christ, and Christ then rebuked Peter and clarified discipleship. And then in chapter 9, verse 1, Jesus makes this statement, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. That's a, quite a fascinating statement. It likely refers to the transfiguration that's going to occur, where the, the veil is taken away and the glory of Christ is seen. But regardless, what we're finding here is that the kingdom of God the kingdom of God includes a supernatural power, right? You, there's some who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. There, there's a supernatural element to the kingdom of God. And it, and it wraps in much of what the New Testament will expand, whether it's the transfiguration, the resurrection, the establishment of the church. All of that is part of the kingdom of God and a demonstration of the supernatural power of God. One last passage as we answer this question, what is the kingdom of God? Chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, and look at verse 25. Mark chapter 14, verse 25. This is when Jesus is taking the Last Supper with His disciples. And we'll begin in verse 24. He says, This is My blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So there's a day coming, Jesus says, when he will drink of the fruit of the vine. But it won't be until that day. And he'll drink it new in the kingdom of God. And so from this passage, we see that the kingdom of God includes a future material culmination. Right, back in chapter 1, there's spiritual aspects. Repent, believe the gospel. And now here, Jesus is speaking of drinking the fruit of the vine in, uh, new in the kingdom of God. There's a future material culmination. 
So taking these passages, what, is, what can we conclude that the kingdom of God is? One of the simplest definition uh, comes from the glossary of the book Biblical Doctrine, which is uh, MacArthur's Systematic Theology, and the, and the definition, a very simple and helpful definition, it's the reign of God, the reign of God, whether internally within the hearts of humans or externally on the earth. And that captures a number of elements. It's the reign of God in its simplest form. It's the reign of God, whether internally within the hearts of humans or externally on the earth. But let's expand that a little bit with a, a description. And this, this reaches across the whole of Scripture as we bring these passages uh, to bear on our understanding of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God in its broadest sense represents the rule of God over all creation, history, and individuals. Man rejects this rule, and that goes all the way back to chapter 3 in the fall. Man rejects this rule, and, and, and Adam all sin. Man rejects this rule, and God reestablishes it through Jesus Christ. Individually through redemption, you've been transferred from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of His beloved Son. Collectively in the church, and ultimately in the new heavens and the new earth. There's a reestablishment of God's reign that is taking place individually and re through redemption, collectively in the church, and ultimately in the new heavens and new earth. A great and final separation will take place when all those rejecting God's reign will be permanently condemned to endure His wrath, and all those turning to Christ will enjoy fellowship in His gracious presence. Paul says in Colossians chapter 1 and verses 19 and 20 that there's coming a day when all things in heaven and earth will be reconciled in Christ Jesus. Everything that's upside down will be righted under the rule of God. But in this age, in this age, the kingdom of God is a spiritual rule of God in the lives of the redeemed. But there's a future culmination anticipated by those in Christ. In other words, the fullness of the culmination is not here and now. There's an already aspect, and there's a not yet aspect. In Romans chapter 14, if you want to turn over to that passage, Romans chapter 14, Paul expresses... as he's dealing with differences among believers about matters of conscience. He says in verse 17, "...the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit." It's a spiritual, there's a spiritual rule of God in the lives of the, of the redeemed right now. So he goes on and says, whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Why? Because the kingdom of God is a spiritual entity. We're in the, we're in the age of grace where God, by his grace, is individually transferring people from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. But there is indeed a future culmination, and we saw that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, that you will be worthy of the kingdom of God. And then also, if you would turn to a familiar passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul here is instructing and, and warning the Corinthians and also encouraging them in verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? 
Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. And his point is there's coming a day when those who have been justified will indeed inherit the fullness of the kingdom of God. When Christ comes in power and establishes his rule. So the kingdom includes this already and not yet. There's uh, the kingdom of God in grace and the coming kingdom in power. But yet those spiritual realities that citizens of the kingdom have, those spiritual realities dictate our daily priorities, don't they? That's what Jesus addressed in Matthew 6, 33, when he said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, spiritual realities, and all these other things will be added unto you. Well, if the kingdom of God is this way, and maybe a picture would be helpful. I, this, this has been helpful for me, and I hope, it, I hope it's helpful that, that the kingdom of God, as you, as you look at it through Scripture and the teaching of Scripture, is kind of like a, a river. It begins real small at, at its source and then broadens as it flows, becomes a mighty force of a current, and then a huge ocean as it empties out. And I don't know where to place what part of the kingdom. I guess I'd say right now there's, there, we're kind of on the, in the river, but it's, it's coming to this, this ultimate outbreak into this huge ocean that we have, we have no idea how wonderful that's going to be. But who gets into the kingdom of God? Who gets into the kingdom of God? Well, Jesus answers this question in multiple passages, and we've already touched on some of those, so I think this is going to be a, a pretty simple exercise, but let's go back to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, this time back to verse 47. Mark chapter 9, verse 47 Again, this is where Jesus is dealing with being a stumbling block, and he says, If your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. Who gets into the kingdom? Well, first of all, those who take sin seriously those who take sin seriously. There's some radical amputation here that's taking place. There's some making no provision for the flesh that is taking place. I recently have been reading uh, The Vanishing Conscience by John MacArthur, and one of the, one of the titles in uh, chapter titles is Hacking Agag to Pieces. And, and he uses the Old Testament story of when Saul disobeyed God's command to eradicate the Amalekites, and Samuel had to correct that by eradicating the Amor Amalekites, he uses that as an example to say, that's how you deal with sin. You eradicate it. You, 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 you root it out. You kill it. Paul says something similar in Colossians chapter 3, that you put to death what is earthly in you. This is what kingdom citizens do, and, and it makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, what are we talking about? We're talking about the kingdom of God. Can God tolerate sin? Does God wink at sin? God is holy. God is pure. God 
hates sin. God dealt with sin through the precious blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And those who are under his rule, those who are in his kingdom, are those who hate sin. And sure, we don't hate it like we ought to. But it's what Paul instructs us in 1 Corinthians, again, chapter 6. Look, if your life is characterized by coddling sin, all right, those people don't inherit the kingdom of God. It's those that hate sin. And we can praise the Lord that when those temptations rise, when we fall and the Lord convicts us and there is sorrow in our heart, and when in the grace of God and by His strength, by the strength of the Lord, we're enabled to overcome sin, that that is an expression of the rule of God in our lives. They hate sin. Secondly, in chapter 10, chapter 10, look at verses 14 and 15. Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Jesus gives a, a precious picture here for us of a trusting child. Children are so trusting. And there's a humility. Those who enter the kingdom of God are those who are trusting, are humble enough to entrust themselves to the Lord. So we could say those who practice humility, those who take sin seriously, those who practice humility. Further on in chapter 10, look at verse 23. After the rich young man, disheartened, goes away sorrowful, Jesus says to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said to them, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man is, it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Those who enter the kingdom of heaven are those who acknowledge their poverty. In the eyes of the disciples, someone who was wealthy was someone who was blessed. That's why it was so difficult for a wealthy person to, to enter the kingdom of God. It, they, they assumed, oh, I'm blessed. I have this wealth. And, and Jesus is saying, no, that's not what the kingdom of God is about. The kingdom of God is for those who acknowledge that, that they've sinned and they repent and they believe the gospel. You have to acknowledge your spiritual poverty. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Further on in chapter 12, as the religious leaders are testing Jesus, attempting to overthrow his authority with the question of paying taxes to Caesar, the question of the resurrection, and the question of the great commandment, after Jesus identifies the great commandment in verse 32, Mark 12, verse 32, the scribe who had come to him responded, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and that there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. I didn't say that this man was a part of it yet, but he said, you're not far. Well, what was it that indicated he was not far from the kingdom of God? Well, there was a, a, an understanding of Scripture with, with a degree of spiritual accuracy. Right? When, when Jesus 
taught and said, here, here is the great commandment. He accepted that and he said, yeah, I, I, I see that. There's an understanding, a receptivity to Scripture with spiritual accuracy. It looks like from this passage, he, he just hasn't realized that he's failed. He's close. He understands the Scripture with, with a degree of spiritual accuracy. And then finally, in, in chapter 15, in verse 43, after Jesus dies on the cross for our sins, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And from there, we, we see someone who very simply serves Christ willingly. He serves Christ willingly. Now, those who take sin seriously, who practice humility, who acknowledge their poverty, who understand Scripture with spiritual accuracy and serve Christ, there's actually a foundational response that leads to all of those things. And if you go back to chapter 1, Mark chapter 1, again, we're answering this question, who gets into the kingdom? And we've identified those who take sin seriously, those who practice humility, those who acknowledge their poverty, who understand Scripture with spiritual accuracy and serve Christ willingly, but foundationally. Jesus came proclaiming the gospel of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Who gets into the kingdom of God? Those who obey Christ's command to repent and keep on repenting and believe and keep on believing the gospel that Christ came into the world to save his people from their sins, that he died, that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day. And that He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And you turn away, you turn away from your sin and you turn to the Savior. And you receive blessing from your Savior of forgiveness of sins and of new life in Him. You believe, you believe that He is your Lord and that He is your King. David Brainerd's burden for the Indians was not something that he was born with. It wasn't innate. He died at age 29, but he wasn't converted until he was 21 years old. He grew up under sound preaching. And yet, there were three doctrines that provoked fleshly resistance in him to the King of Kings. Those three doctrines were the strictness of the law of God, the fact that faith alone was the condition of salvation, and the sovereignty of God. One biographer writes, the first vexed him greatly because he could not, try as he might, live up to the law's demands. This caused him to quarrel with God because of the strictness and rigidity of his law. The second troubled him because he could not find out what faith was and how he could obtain it. But it was the doctrine of divine sovereignty against which he especially rebelled. On this, he said, I could not bear that it should be wholly at God's pleasure to save or damn me, just as he would. 
that passage, Romans 9, 11 through 23, was a constant vexation to me, especially verse 21. Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? Reading or meditating on this always destroyed my seeming good frames. For when I thought I was almost humbled and almost resigned, this passage would make my enmity to the sovereignty of God appear. He was frustrated that there was a king and it wasn't him. But on Friday, July 12th, 1939, Brainerd recounts that, quote, unspeakable glory seemed to open to the view and apprehension of my soul. It was a new inward apprehension or view that I had of God, such as I never had before, nor anything which had the least resemblance of it prior. He goes on to recount that, quote, his soul was so captivated and delighted with the excellency, loveliness, greatness, and other perfections of God that I was even swallowed up in him, at least to the degree that I had no thought, as I remember at first, about my own salvation and scarce reflected that there was such a creature as myself. And as a result of God's converting work in his life, Brainerd was brought to, quote, a hearty disposition to exalt the Lord, to aim at his honor and to glory in him as the king of the universe. That's the testimony of a kingdom citizen. That's the testimony of a man that belongs to the kingdom of God. Now, our testimonies and the way God brings us to himself varies. But there will always be a consistency that those who are in Christ are those who acknowledge that he is indeed the king of the universe and that they are part members, citizens of his kingdom. The last statement from him concerning this, he says the sense of the sense of peace and joy was so delightful to him that he said, I was amazed I had not dropped my own contrivances and complied with this lovely, blessed, and excellent way before. Well, we're always struggling with our own contrivances, aren't we? But the joy and the comfort and the, of the truth of the kingdom of God is that we can drop those and rest in the rule of God and be at peace with Him through Jesus Christ as citizens of His kingdom. Jesus said in Luke 16, 16, the law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone forces his way into it. Do you know that urgency? I need to be a kingdom citizen. I want to be a kingdom citizen. I'm striving with his grace to be a kingdom citizen. That's the operation of the good news of Jesus Christ, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, proclaiming the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Father, thank you for establishing your rule through your Son, Jesus Christ. We are so thankful for your mercy and for your grace that has drawn so many of us to you. Lord, we pray tonight for those who are in darkness. We pray that you would extend mercy to them, that, that they would understand that the kingdom of God is a sweet place to be. There's peace and blessing in Christ. 
And Lord, we pray that you would strengthen our souls for the balance of this week, that we might serve our King with joy and with energy for his glory. And we ask it in his name. Amen. Thanks for listening from Truth Community Church in Cincinnati, Ohio. You can find church information and other helpful materials at thetruthpulpit.com. This message is copyrighted, all rights reserved.